Hello. I guess we're we're live now. <laughs> All right. So as you guys know, um, I don't do this too often, so I'll see if uh, I got everything set up right. Um, maybe somebody in the comments let me know if the audio is okay. Uh, I'm flying blind here, no ears, so not really sure. Um, we'll just wait a little bit to make sure the stragglers jump on the stream. Uh, what we're going to be doing today is talking about squirrel waffle, whatever the heck that is. So I think what I can do here is um, pull up this malware traffic analysis blog from Brad. Um, so this is the first time I heard of this thing called squirrel waffle. It's a crazy name. I don't know if Brad just came up with that or if it actually is what the malware devs call it. Um, honestly, the only reason why I looked at this is because it sounds hilarious. And uh, somebody in our Discord uh, was asking for some pointers on it. So I was like, what the heck is that? And I figured I'd come and uh, take a look at it uh, live. So um, as we wait, oh yeah, a few more people jumping in the stream. Um, yeah, we'll get started in a minute. So basically what this is, is this is a loader. Um, so you can see here, Brad's done a nice job of kind of showing us the execution chain here. So they have uh, maldoc, I think it runs like it has a macro, there's some VB script in it. Um, and then that uh, downloads this uh, squirrel waffle DLL, which is itself a um, downloader. So it's basically just a, a simple loader. And uh, when I was looking at it, uh, Greetings from Kenya. Hey, Kenya, shout out. So um, when I was looking at it, uh, this is actually a nice um, piece of malware to do a tutorial on or a live stream because it's super simple. Um, but there's lots of cool, um, lots of interesting tricks that we can sort of show and demonstrate uh, with a sample that's pretty easy to understand. So uh, that's why I thought it'd be nice to kind of do this live. Uh, basically, the purpose of this uh, malware is to download and execute a final stage payload. So it is kind of a dropper. I'm not sure. I saw someone in the chat saying um, it, the squirrel waffle thing comes from some strings that are Russian uh, saying squirrel donut. So if that's true, that's kind of funny. Um, I guess that's where the name comes from. Uh, okay. so. I think there's probably enough of you here. We're almost at 10 past, so that's probably enough time to uh, jump in here. Uh, I will actually show you, um, I don't know. Actually, it's probably easy enough just to see in the traffic here. So um, basically, we're gonna do everything static today. Uh, so we're gonna just do it in IDA. Um, it's a sample that's easy to statically reverse engineer. Uh, there's not a lot of components to it. But uh, I did want to just mention that I took a look at this blog uh, here and I took a look at the PCAP before I started analyzing it. So I had an idea of what the C2 URLs look like. Um, so you can see actually here in the image, um, it's pretty easy to see. So they're doing uh, these post requests uh, with a URL string that's a bunch of, uh, it looks like maybe base 64 encoded characters or something. Um, so and it does a bunch of these different uh, posts to, so you can see there's probably going to be a bunch of different C2 URLs here uh, They're going to be looking for and specifically what we're going to be doing on stream here is looking for the config and How to extract it statically in Python um, So we won't be like reverse engineering the whole rat. Um, that's something or so, sorry the whole loader That's something we can maybe do another time or maybe I'll make a video on it or something like that But today we'll be focused specifically on the config um what else do we need to know about it? Oh, it's packed. Um, <laughs> you guys get to see my OBS magic here in a second. So uh, it's packed, and in order to get the uh, to get the sample, I just unpacked it with Unpack Me. Um, so you can see here, like this is the parent that I uploaded, and uh, this is the child that it unpacked. Um, the unpacked child has this loader export. Um, and I'll show you in IDA when we open this up. That's where the uh, the entry point for the code is. That's what we're going to be looking at. Um, let me see if this uh, 
Yeah, actually, so I saw there's a question in the chat. Will I be uploading the config extractor to GitHub? Yes, I'll show you guys how this is going to be set up. I'm actually going to use our lab notes, which is a Jupyter notebook, and I'll just push the notes live to our GitHub afterwards so you guys can download them and, and use them, uh, no problem. Um, okay, so let me try this OBS thing. I really want to try it. I, I set it up last night. Uh, let me see if this works. Unpack me, a malware unpacking service from Open Analysis. Expose the malware before it exposes you. I don't know if that worked or not. <laughs> I get a kick of that every time I hear it. I've heard it like a million times. It still makes me laugh. Okay, anyway, so that's where we got our sample. Uh, it was from Unpack Me, and uh, I've actually already dropped it over to my uh, desktop here. Uh, it's under Documents, Malware, Squirrel, something. Uh, squirrel Waffle. Yeah, so we'll be looking at this here, and that's the Unpack Child. Um, I'll also throw this on Malshare and I'll drop the link. I'll put it in the description below the video. I'll put a link to this on Malshare. So if you guys don't want to open an unpacking account or whatever, just go over to Malshare and you can download the unpack file and play along from home. Okay, so uh, with that, let's open this up in Ida and uh, see what we've got here. Documents, malware, squirrel level. Okay, uh, let it do its thing here. Um, and of course, like I said, there's two exports here. Um, there's the entry point, and you can see here, the entry point doesn't really do very much. Um, what we want to do is look at this loader here, a loader entry point. And for this tutorial, uh, so if you can see there's only one call here. So for this tutorial, um, I'm going to also use the Hexrays decompiler, obviously, it's a paid product, uh, it's pretty expensive. You can do the same thing in G-Hydra, G-Hydra, Hail Hydra, but um, I won't be using that. I'll be using the uh, hex series decompiler today, but pretty much the same steps you can do in G-Hydra or whatever you want to use. Um, so we'll F5 this. Yes, go ahead. And I like to set up my decompiler and my uh, disassembly windows side by side. Text view, drag this over so you guys can see it a little bit more. Um, let me know in the chat if the font is too small. I hope it's okay to see. If it's too small, I'll try and make it a little bit bigger. Um, just let me know. So, um, oh yeah, I saw it in the chat. Um, you can unpack this with x64 debug. Yes, uh, this is actually a really simple malware. Um, you could do a memory breakpoint. There's many tutorials on our channel of how to unpack stuff manually using the debugger and uh, the 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 memory watch um, uh, series of tutorials we've done where you do a breakpoint on alloc on virtual alloc and you watch what's written into memory space um, that'll work for this sample if you don't want to use unpack me so yeah go ahead um, okay so it's too small uh, too small in the chat okay I'm gonna try and make this font a little bit bigger here uh, I don't think I've ever made the font bigger, uh, so I'm not sure how to do it. If somebody wants to let me know, I will do it. How do we make it bigger? <laughs> uh, no, is it under edit? And review maybe? How do I make this bigger? Can I just do like a control shift plus? No. Come on, Ida. All right. Well, until somebody helps me out in the chat, lets me know how to make this font bigger, I will. Control plus does not work. Uh... Oh, there we go. There we go. All right, let's make it 14. Okay. Is that good? Can you guys see this okay? Uh, let me know. I think this is probably, this might be too big. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I mean, it's okay. Uh, hopefully, it's not too big for you guys. It's a little big for me on my screen. It's like, <laughs> you know, each character is like an inch tall. Um, anyway, okay. So we've loaded up our uh, 
our binary in IDA, we have our decompiled view here. And if you guys are diehard OA Labs fans, you'll know this trick that I'm going to do next, where we do produce file, C file. I'll just drop it in the uh, directory here. And the reason why I'm doing this is because this forces IDA to decompile every function, and that will help fix up some of the arguments and stuff like that if there's any uh, issues with um, with the initial uh, easy pass through that it does in IDA. So now that we've done that, we can F5 again in the window here. Okay, there you go. So you can see that that actually fixed some of these, um, some of the function, some of the arguments, um, the function prototypes here. So uh, always helpful to do that uh, when you start analyzing. And <laughs> I sorry, I just on the chat. <laughs> yeah, people watching people watching these tutorials on their phones. It is not going to be a good experience. I mean, I can't imagine how small the IDA window must be on your phone. Um, yeah, to get the most out of this, you probably want to watch on a desktop where you can make the window a little bit bigger. Um, <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, so now that we have done the uh, decompile all, so we forced IDA to decompile every function, you can see some of the arguments here have been fixed up. Uh, this is again the entry point. Uh, if we just go back to xrefs here. Um, so this is the loader entry point, the export for the DLL, and there's only one function in it. So we know we have to start there. And if we start there, we already see on our screen here some interesting stuff. So I see this kind of looks like maybe a base64 encoded string or some sort of string. And of course, we're looking for an encrypted config. So, you know, that's probably a good place to start. And if we look at this function here, well, um, this is the beginning of the, uh, of the entry point function. And the only function that's called each time is the same, you know, it's only one function being called. There's no other functionality so far uh, in the beginning of this function here, just these this function being called again and again. And what's being passed to this function? Well, strings, we can see here, there's a bunch of strings being passed and the string length, you know, my guess is this function is some sort of uh, string struct um, setup. So if we take a look at it here, ooh, nasty assembly, not assembly, but nasty bit banging stuff here, um, which I don't want to reverse engineer, but we can probably get away with at least cleaning up the arguments a little bit here. Um, so we can work through this and figure out what this function is doing, but let's clean up the arguments and see if that helps. So what I mean by that is you can see you have this uh, variable here and uh, see how it's like this variable, uh, the, uh, uh, mem the memory address of this variable plus five, um, that indicates to me that this is a struct, that they're actually passing a structure, uh, pass by reference, a uh, struct in this variable here. And now they're dereferencing the, the struct in, see how that's plus five? Anytime you see this in IDA, this means that there is a struct and you need to fix that um, variable type before you can continue reverse engineering. Now we've covered this in a bunch of other uh, tutorials. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, this is completely new. You can check out our C++ tutorial and I'll explain exactly what's going on here. Um, but for now, let's see if we can do, oh, create new struct type. Heck yeah, Ida, I like that. Oh, did that not work? There we go. Okay, so Ida is creating a new struct type. Uh, now, I don't like these gaps. What these gaps mean is Ida doesn't know what the variable, uh, the variables are that should go in this space. It knows that there's one because there's a reference to the first um, variable in the struct or the first, uh, what do you call it in a struct? The first entry or element, sorry, in a struct. And it knows there's references to the last two elements, but it doesn't know in between. So it creates this sort of byte stream. Now, I like to clean these up and just turn them into D words. Um, so it's 12 bytes, that's going to be three D words. So let's clean this up here. Um, and then the reason why I like to do that is because oftentimes this struct will be used in other uh, functions and those uh, the that gap is going to be referenced as a D word somewhere else. It might not be, it might be referenced as uh, say a string of bytes or something, but if we see that we can fix it later. It's, uh, it's usually better to start with uh, D words just to get a clean slate. So 3D words, and I like to label them. So that the first one would be D word zero. So this will be D word one. 
two, three, four, and five. And I'm going to rename this as struct string because we know that it's some sort of string. I don't know what kind of string yet. So now this cleans up, you can see here, this cleans up this code a little bit. And we get to already label one of our structure elements. So we know that the size here, because that's the size, and we know that's the size if we go back, because they're passing, ooh, see that structure fixed some of our code here, because we know that we're passing the string length as the final argument in this function. So that's why this is a size. So let's go down here and we'll rename this element with the N key to size. Okay, all right. Let's go back because um, I saw that when I added that struct, I saw that that actually fixed our code a little bit here. Whoa, there's a lot of calls to this function. Uh -huh. So let's go back here and in our code here, I'll just hit an F5. Uh, it usually decompiles each time you pop into it, but F5 just to fix anything up. And we can see that these are now automatically called string struct. So Ida has helpfully renamed that variable and fixed it up in our main code here. So that should make this a little bit easier to read. So we can see that now these um, structures are being passed into this um, string like I don't know what it is. It's transforming string into some sort of structure. Um, and we can also see, which is kind of cool here, this um, long interesting string is being copied into this structure. So we'll do var, I'll just rename this as var string uh, b64. So that looks like maybe a base64 encoded string, or maybe not actually, no, that's not right. That's not a base64 encoded string, that's something else. Um, string, interesting. <laughs> all right, <laughs> so we can see, uh, remember these are all, I'll just actually name this function. We don't know exactly what it does, but we know that it does something. So it's like a string struct parse. Okay, again, uh, this is kind of, you're getting an inside window into how I reverse engineer. I don't actually know exactly what this does. I'll come back and figure it out if I need to, but right now I'm really focused on trying to get that config out. So I'm just labeling it. We kind of understand what it does. We know that it's creating the structure that we've defined. We don't have all the elements of the structure defined yet, but we can kind of figure it out uh, as we go. And uh, this allows you to do this a little bit quicker. Um, it's definitely not the most thorough way, and I'm sure there's a few uh, reverse engineers out there screaming, hitting their keyboard. But again, this is the fast way to do it. Uh, and hopefully, we're 25 minutes in, hopefully we can get a full config extractor in under an hour. That's the goal for today. So, um, oh, actually, look at this. So we have our interesting string here. What do we have here? We have a chunk of data <laughs> I just saw in the uh, in the chat somebody's making me nervous because they're <laughs> they're a real reverse engineer watching me. Yeah, I think there's a few uh, pretty solid reverse engineers. I saw some names in there I recognize. <laughs> uh, I'll uh, I'll look forward to your DMs later <laughs> on how I can improve my <laughs> my struct setup and my naming uh, conventions. Okay, um, so anyway, we have this, uh, this is a pointer to somewhere in memory, and uh, it's also being passed to this string struct parse uh, thing. So let's take a look at it. Uh, I'll slide over into our disassembly window here. And uh, so this is the chunk of data. We'll just name it as a pointer to a block of data. Actually, I'll just... I like to call them blobs. Just keep my naming convention the same uh, for the stream. I like to call them blobs. <laughs> so we see this is a blob of kind of weird string data. Um, it's definitely not a string I understand. You know, I can't read it, but it is some sort of data in memory here in the R data section. And uh, it's also being passed to the uh, string parsing. Uh, function here. 
and this is the string length that's been passed in the past, so we know this is probably the length of that data. So um, this is interesting. I'm going to rename this as var blob. Uh, what did I call the other one? Uh, string blob. Yeah, I'll call this one var str blob. OK. And that gets passed into this function here. Oh, interesting. OK. What do we do in here? Let's fix the um, function type here. We'll go back. And so they're passing in. This is, again, the struct that we've created. So this is the struct underscore string. So let's press Y, and we'll change the uh, argument type here for the function. So this is going to be struct string. OK. And if we pop, oh, that fix things a little bit. If we pop in here, uh, there we go. That looks good. Is this, so the first argument, is that's also yeah, that's also a structure of some sort. I wonder if it's a similar structure. V4. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. I don't know. Let's see if we change this to struct string. Let's see if that works. Does that make sense? think so. OK, so this must be some sort of translation function. Again, not going not going too deep in here. Uh, we can, again, always come back and reverse engineer these. Uh, always come back and reverse engineer these functions in detail if we need to. Uh, right now, we're kind of going as fast as we can to try and get the config. Um, if I was going to write a report on this, I would obviously go back and figure out what these things are doing um, specifically. But right now, we're still kind of laser set focused on the config. And we can see this is probably some sort of copy of that blob. OK. Um, and now this makes our next function uh, pretty interesting. The only thing we're passing to this function is that blob from memory and this interesting string. Now, we're passing different elements from each structure in there, but we're passing basically you know, just two pieces of data into this function. Um, if I had to guess, guess there's probably going to be some decryption, because this looks like, in memory, remember, this is our big blob. This looks like an encrypted piece of data, and this looks like some sort of decryption key. And that's what it looks like to me. But let's figure it out. So come in here. There is a ton of arguments to this function. And so it's going to be a little bit messy at first. But not a big deal. We can kind of figure it out. Oh, <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, anyway, this is what I saw um, when I first, before the stream, when I first looked at this. Um, this was the function I looked at. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this on stream. This is pretty simple. Um, but. Uh, so we found that again. So basically, here, so you have a for loop here, and you have an XOR, uh, you know, an XOR operation here uh, with the elements. You know, they're they're being incremented in the for loop, and you have a percent. So uh, I'm not explaining this right. Basically, whenever you see something like this, like a loop that's iterating over something. And it's XORing it with something percent something. So the percent is a modulus. So it's basically you're taking the uh, remainder from uh, the um, from the iteration of the for loop. So uh, the reason why you use this is because you have a key that's shorter than the data that you want to XOR with. So you just wrap over the key as the data increases. So you have a pointer that goes across the data. And then as the pointer uh, wraps, like as the pointer gets bigger than the key, you take the modulus of the pointer, and that'll just wrap it around the key. So I don't expect everyone to know this. But anytime you see something that looks like this, a loop with an XOR and then a mod for the pointer, 
it, it's almost a hundred percent a simple XOR uh, with a, a looping key. Like that's that's pretty much what this is. So uh, we can go a little bit further uh, just so you guys can see. Yeah, remainder of div division, exactly. So I saw in the chat someone saying the modulus is the remainder of division. Yes, that's exactly what it is. So you're basically like, instead of uh, incrementing over the entire pointer, you're shrinking it down so that it only increments over the length of whatever you're modding it by. So I'm assuming this length is probably gonna be the length of the key. So it's probably gonna be the length of whatever is in here. So let's uh, actually take a look at that A11. So argument 11, that's the second last argument. So let's go back here and look at what the second last argument is. Oh, look at that. It's the size of this interesting string. So now things are starting to, um, you know, they're starting to come together. Uh, what's the other size? So that's zero, one, two, three, four arguments in. So zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, four. Is that the loop? Yeah, that's the loop. Okay, so let's rename this as arg data length. And we'll rename this name arg len or key len. Okay, so then I would assume this is the pointer name of our pointer. And then this would probably be var key. And then this would be var data. Okay, um, and that's that's pretty much what we have here. Uh, what are, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is very straightforward. So uh, what's the data? Well, it's the first argument. If you guys remember, what's the first argument here? Well, it's our data blob, the D word one from our data blob. So. At this point, this is pretty much, uh, you know, this is pretty straightforward. What I'd like to do at this point is instead of continuing to reverse engineer and wasting our time here, let's just try and validate our hypothesis. So I think that this stuff is the data, this is the key, and it's a simple XOR. So let's pop up in CyberChef here. See, I already have it open. Um, let's grab our key here. Cyberchef, oops, this isn't right. Let's look at that key. Okay, Cyberchef, we're gonna do an XOR. It's not hex, it is UTF-8. And we're going to do the blob memory here so we're going to highlight it scroll down to the bottom here of course we have the length here but i think we probably won't even need that because this crazy string is probably going to terminate with a nice null byte and then we'll know we're at the end here so let's keep scrolling down keep going oh my god it's huge that's what she said no that's what she said jokes on the stream oh my god dating myself Okay, let's keep going. Oh, did somebody say binary refinery? Yeah, I should do this with binary refinery. <laughs> I just, the visual element of CyberChef is better for explaining how things work <laughs> than like a bunch of like crazy uh, uh, Perl syntax. But yes, to speed this up, just if you're trying to go as fast as you could, yeah, binary refinery would probably already have this ripped apart. Okay, uh, yeah, we got an L byte here. So let's shift and check this out. OA Labs tool, copy hex, heck yeah. Go over here, paste our hex in. Um, we have to convert this from hex. From hex, we'll move this up. Hey, look at that. So we have now decrypted the string. And what is it? Well, it's a list of IP addresses. I think I saw on uh, maybe on Twitter or uh, a blog post or something that they have a block list in it. Um, so I think that's probably what we found here. So that leads me to think that there isn't actually a config in the uh, in Squirrel Rat. It makes me think that they actually have a bunch of 
uh, encrypted data sections that they just decrypt and use. So there isn't like one config. There's probably just a bunch of um, of these like data blobs. So let's actually uh, make our assembly window a little bit bigger. So we're looking at the memory here. We're looking at the R data section. And let's look and see if there's any more of these like, um, oh yeah, there's another one right here. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so it looks like they have uh, encrypted data here and they basically have an encrypted blob followed by the key in R data. So this is, uh, I guess there's probably gonna be another one. Um, let's see. Uh, well, actually, it's probably easier just to find it using the xrefs to that function. So we'll just rename this as uh, decrypt data. Oops, I didn't write, spell that right. Decrypt data. Okay, we'll do xrefs to it. Okay, yeah, a few xrefs to it. Um, so what are they doing here? Uh, that's a little key. Uh, what are they doing here? Oh, that's the same one. What are they doing here? Um, okay. Oh, that's the one we just looked at. Uh, so I think I probably skipped over probably one of these, right? Uh, there we go. Is that the one we just looked at? I'm not really sure. But... Uh, Oops. Oh yeah, there, there we go, there's a different one. Okay, so there's this one as well. Um, let's grab that, see what that is. Oh no, that's the one we were just looking at. I'm confused now. Let's go back, back. Yeah, this is the one that we haven't seen yet. Okay, so we'll copy that. Decryption string here. And let's grab the bytes for that decryption string. Pop back in here. Uh, is this giant as well? Yeah, this is a giant. Oh, it's not that giant. Not too bad. Not too bad. Okay. So let's grab this chunk of data and see what we get. Uh, shift copy. Hex copy. Thanks, OA Labs. On our GitHub, if you want that plugin, all it does, it doesn't really do anything too crazy. It just allows me to right click hex copy. Um, obviously you can do, I think it's like edit export bytes. Uh, yeah, export data. So you could do it this way as well as hex strings. So all that plugin does is just saves me one extra click or two extra clicks. Um, okay, so let's paste this in here. Paste it in. Hey, look at that. Looks like our C2s. So there we go. So we found a block list in the data and we found uh, our C2 list. And we're at 1239, 1240. So we're doing pretty good, but that isn't what I promised you today. This is just the first part. What I promised you today was a static config extractor. And this is where you're gonna get a couple tips on how, uh, you know, industry, uh, industry hardened Sergey <laughs> does config extraction because there's a lot of uh, gotchas in static config extraction. So I'll start out with what I'm not going to do today and then I'll show you what I'm going to do. So uh, there are actually, let me start out with saying there's a couple different ways to do config extraction statically. So first of all, you need an unpacked binary. So we have an unpacked binary here. Uh, obviously, if you want to automate this kind of stuff, you know, you blast through unpack me or some other unpacking service, then you run your static config extractor on it, you get the config, right? That's kind of how this works. Now the static config extractor, you can kind of do three different things. I mean, there's there's all, all kinds of different ways you can extract the config, but you know, in my experience, there's three different ways to approach it. Number one, if the um, function here Let's actually do a synchronize with our disassembly. And uh, yeah, so sorry, I just see somebody has to drop in the chat and they're saying, will this stream be a video once it's over? Yes, we will leave this up as a video so you can come back and watch it anytime. No pressure to stay on the stream, but you know, if you wanna stick around, uh, you can ask questions and I can answer them. So that's the only thing you can't get if you wait for the video. Um, I won't be live to answer questions, but Remember, we have a Discord uh, link in the description of the video, so you can jump on Discord and ask questions there if you want. Okay, so, 
Oh, you guys might hear my dog. My dog's back from his walk. You might hear his heavy breathing in the background. Okay, so um, where were we? We want to look at uh, different ways to extract this config statically. So one thing you can do is you can look at the assembly code here for uh, the decryption function. And you can see if there's something unique about it. So maybe this XOR here. And you can see if there is, let me show you guys here. Options, general, uh, show me the bytes, opcodes. So you can see this is actually the hex data that's going to be available in the file. And this matches up to the assembly. So you can write YAR rules and you can write regexes based on this data here. And that's how you basically identify these different pieces of code in the uh, in the function. So one way to write a config extractor is to write some sort of regex that finds, um, you know, let's say this uh, this byte pattern here, which is the XOR, um, and then you can use some sort of offset to try and find, you know, uh, some data that's being passed to it. Now this is a bad bad example for that because the um, data that's being passed to this function is being passed as an argument. So it's not anywhere near this actual decryption routine in the code. So it's not going to work for that. And also this decryption routine is pretty generic. It's like, you know, you're just doing an XOR. Uh, there's lots of variables in here. Obviously all of these things can change depending on how the compiler is set up, um, you know, depending on how you, um, you know, how you're, uh, doing the compiling of the binary. If that changes, these values might change. They might use different registers, so then the bytes will change. So that's not always the best. It's good if you are um, writing config extractor for something like, say, like Drydex or TrickBot, where the code is almost never changing. You know, they blast out a billion versions of it. That kind of stuff, it's good to do this sort of, um, you know, quick regexy type stuff. Um, the next thing is, the next approach you could take is you could say, okay, well, you know what? I want the disassembly context for this file. And I can see some people are thinking about this in the chat. They're saying like, oh, could you use like uh, Radari 2 or Cutter or whatever um, to do this? And the answer is yes, but in practice in the industry, no. So uh, could you basically write a, so you could use like, um, what's that? Uh, disassembler that everybody uses. I can't, doesn't come to mind right now. Anyway, you can use like a uh, capstone. Um, is that right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so you can use like a disassembler in your plugin and you could de uh, disassemble this code and you could do things like say, look for some sort of um, some sort of marker to identify this function. And then you could say, look in the disassembly for all the X refs to this function, right? Just like what we've done here, you could do all this in code. And then you could say, what are the arguments to this function? And then you could use like, you know, you could basically work your way back, uh, in the disassembly. Now, th this is something that I've seen done and I've done it myself for simple, uh, programs, but running in production, disassembling all this code. Uh, you know, if you have millions of files going through, it's slow and it's it's just not very elegant, right? And you're still stuck with things like, well, this is a struct. So the, so the, <laughs> the argument for this is actually comes from another function that has another argument passed to it. So you have all kinds of nested crap in the disassembly that you have to walk up um, programmatically, right? You have to do all of that and you have to build it in a way that it's robust. So if they change things, your config extractor doesn't just blow apart, right? So this is, again, this is a method. A lot of people who are starting out will try and do this for config extraction because it makes the most sense because it's the closest to the way you would manually do it, right? Because you can replicate the steps that I just showed here today in code, right? You can do the same things I did. You could like, you know, find the arguments, walk back. What function did the arguments come from? Okay, where, where did those arguments come from? Okay, now find this, you know, offset in the uh, R data, R data section. Okay, what data is in there? That's, you know, you can do that stuff programmatically. But again, with a more complex thing with structs and stuff like that, it's not always gonna work the best. So the third way is also kind of frowned on, but it's the way I do things, which is we look for a pattern of data and we try to use that pattern against the developer. So 
Um, what do I mean by this? Well, hopefully we are uh, 46 minutes into the stream, so hopefully no malware devs are watching right now. Um, basically, when people do stuff like this, they have these like decryption things, they don't want to manually code this, right? This is like a, a real pain to manually code in C. So what they do is they have little helper functions, macros that they can do. So they'll basically put like the data and the uh, key in the macro, and then the macro will auto generate the code for them. So what does this mean? It means that the layout of that data in memory is usually consistent. Even if they change the um, the code, the the way that the macro works for their decryption or the way that the function works for the decryption is usually the same. So we can use that against them. And this is how I write a lot of config extractors that are robust. Um, they work through multiple versions, and this only really works if the developers are kind of, you know, not trash, but like, you know, they're using old methods. And this is definitely a very simple loader using old methods. Um, new methods, very interesting, uh, cool topic that I actually do professionally. So this is, I'm talking about deobfuscation, you know, heavily obfuscated stuff. That's interesting. But this is just a very simple loader. This could have been built, you know, five years ago and nobody would have noticed the difference. It basically looks the same as something we saw five years ago. So what does that mean? Well, that means this kind of trick is going to work. So what is what did we notice here? We noticed that these encrypted data blobs were always followed by the key. And again, this is something that if you've seen enough of these, usually this means they're using some sort of macro in their C++ or some sort of helper function to uh, encrypt this data. Uh, so that they don't have to manually hand code it. So you can see here's another data blob. And after the data blob, this is a really long one. I think this is the block list that we did first. Uh, wow, it's long. Uh, there we go. After that, we have the key. So we have this repeating pattern in the R data section. That's what I want to attack. And the best way to do this I think in this case is to go for size because there's no real discernible pattern um, in the key and the data. So if we look at our strings here, so there's nothing really tell like this is a key versus this is a piece of data, right? You can't really, sometimes you can use regexes, like if there's some sort of special set of bytes in the key that you can use to look for. But in this case, there isn't, it just kind of looks random. So like that's a key and that's data. All right, whatever. But what we do know is that the config for the C2s and for the block list is extremely long, right? So it's probably the longest string in the R data section. So if we look at these, this is all the contiguous block of data. Oops, I went too far. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It looks like it's the longest contiguous block of data in the R data section uh, with no null byte in it. Now, they're using XOR, so you can have null bytes. It's possible, but it's just not as likely, right? You're usually going to have a, a big, long, contiguous string of no null bytes that's going to be a data section, then you're going to have some null bytes, and then you have a key. So how do we do this um, blind, right? How do we do it blind without having to know anything about the binary, without having to load the binary uh, and disassemble it in our extractor or anything like that? Well, we have 10 minutes left on the stream. I'll see how fast I can type, but I think we can probably get this done. So let's go into our uh, documents and our git. Is that right? Um, what do we have in here? Yeah, we have our lab notes. Okay. So uh, if you guys aren't familiar with the way we have this set up, I'll just go to the OA Labs GitHub. So what I've been trying to do is use uh, a Jupyter notebook for these uh, streams. And in each notebook, we're saving the code, um, the Python code that we've written. And you'll see it renders here in the, um, in the notebook. And you can just look at it on GitHub and you can copy this working code out of the notebook if you want. You can also download the Git repository, pull it up and open it in Jupyter Labs. It's all open source. And so if you guys want to follow along from home, what I'm going to be doing now is I'll load up a notebook 
and I think that's going to work. Do I have it installed? Yeah, I have it installed. Okay, great. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I will open up a new folder here. I'll call it Squirrel Waffle. Kill this. Sure, save it. And I want a new Python 3 notebook. And I'm going to save this. Rename it as Squirrel Waffle. Okay, so I'm going to just make the Okay, you guys let me know. That's too big. I can't see it. <laughs> you guys let me know if this font is big enough. Import P file. Is that big enough for you guys to see? Let me know in the chat. And <laughs> make this a little bigger so we can see. Okay. And what I'll do is at the end of the stream, I will just push this to our GitHub so then you guys can follow along with the code uh, at home. So uh, the first thing we want to do, you saw I imported PE file, really useful library, um, super helpful. And uh, we're going to have to actually parse out that R data section. Um, so yeah, all good. Thanks. Thanks, chat. Um, so we're going to have to parse out that R data section. And that is why we have PE file installed because it's the fastest way to sort of parse the structure of a P file. It's not too slow. Um, you know, we can actually, uh, we can actually uh, do it. You know, it's, it's not gonna too taxing. It's not the same as like disassembling the whole file. Um, so let's uh, first, actually let's do that. So we'll do uh, data equals open, oops. Yeah, you guys are gonna see I'm really terrible at typing. <laughs> Uh, and we will open our documents, malware, squirrel waffle, uh, squirrel.bin. We want we want that path here. And we have to escape all this crap here. I'm not used to writing stuff in Windows. I'm just doing it for you guys so I have the VM set up nice. Um, usually using OS X as a development environment, so I have to deal with this kind of crap. But it is what it is. All right. And we'll close this off. I'm going to read it as binary. All right, let's make sure this worked. Did that work? Okay, yeah, it worked, all right. So uh, we now have data that contains, uh, the data variable contains our file here. Of course, when you guys run this on your, uh, at home, you guys are gonna have to put in your own path to the file that you want to extract. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I saw no, no raw string literals in Python. Yes, uh, there are, I could have put an R in front of that and it would have worked fine. I am definitely not as comfortable with Python 3. I've been writing a crap ton of stuff in it, but it's still, it's still, I have a lot of Python 2.7 tendencies where, you know, anyway. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so you could have put an R here in front and remove those backslashes. I probably should have done that. Okay, so now what we wanna do is wanna find that R data section. So let's do, uh, we'll have to create the P file first. So we'll do pfile.pe. Um, you can look up the syntax for this. I just I write it so many times a day that I just know it off by heart. Um, and then we want to for s in p dot sections. Uh, what do we want to do here for each section? Let's check if it's an R data. So if it's binary string dot R data is in the s dot name. So if the section name contains R data then our data equals s dot get data. All right, and then we should probably just to make this a little bit better, um, we should do our data equals none. 
And so now let's just double check here. We'll just print out the length of our data to make sure we get it. We got it. So we'll do, actually, we don't even have to do that. We can just do len of our data. Did that work? Yeah, okay. So we've got the R data section now, uh, all of the binary from that section in um, this variable here. So the next thing we want to do is we want to split it on null bytes. And the reason why, if we look in IDA, we can see that there is no null bytes in our encrypted data here, but there is a null byte before the uh, string and there's a null byte after the decryption key. So it looks like, and there's, I think there's null bytes. Ah, I always do this too fast, scroll too fast. Um, yeah, there we go. And there is a bunch of, if we undo this, there's a bunch of null bytes before the encrypted data as well. So if we go to our data here and we do blocks equals our data dot split, on uh, binary null bytes, then we uh, have to, so we can split that. And of course, if you split a string that has a bunch of null bytes, you're gonna get a bunch of empty strings in that uh, blocks data. So I wanna remove those empty strings. Um, so I'm gonna do blocks equals, and we're gonna use some uh, list comprehension here. Um, so we'll do x uh, for x in blocks if, oops, if x is not equal to an empty string of bytes. All right, see if that works. Okay, so now we have uh, split our R data section into a bunch of blocks and each block is gonna contain some data, but no null bytes. And so if you look, I'll just go back to our IDA again so that we can keep track of what we're doing. So if you look at this, uh, what this actually looks like, one of the blocks should be this data, this encrypted data. And then the next block right after it should be this key. Now, all we have to do is find the blocks that have that sequential data and key. And how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna take advantage of the fact that these config blobs are pretty big. So we can sort them by size and just take the biggest ones and see if that works. So uh, let's sort them by size. We'll do uh, blocks sorted. Oops equals sorted uh, native Python function you guys can use for this. We'll do blocks and we'll do key is len. Okay, that's all right. So uh, let's actually make sure that this makes sense. Let's print the first, the size of the uh, block sorted, the first thing in block sorted so the first element, and let's print the len of the last element, just to make sure we got this right. And I'll make this little tuple using old style Python 2.7 syntax with a new Python 3. What could go wrong, right? Um, Block zero percent D blah, percent D and line of block one uh, negative one is percent D. All right. All right, so the length of the first block is one, length of the last block is 6,542. Uh, let's take a look at that uh, 6,542 block. Actually, no, it'll probably print too much in here. Let's take, let's print a little bit of it. Um, let's print like uh, block sorted. I'll grab the last block. Running out of time. Oh, we're one minute over time. Uh, we didn't quite get it within the hour, um, but hopefully we can. Uh, 
Hopefully we can do this quickly. Oops. Okay, so is that the uh, encrypted data? Looks like the encrypted data to me. So it looks like we have our blocks set up here uh, correctly. Now what we wanna do is we want to create a decryption function, a simple XOR decryption function. So now that we've found the blocks, we'll create a decryption function, and then we'll parse through the blocks and decrypt each section. So let's do that quickly. We'll do def decrypt, still having type, trouble typing, decrypt. Uh, we'll do a key and data. And whoop. We're gonna do out equals a string, do for i in range len of data. So we're gonna iterate a pointer through all of the data. So this is actually exactly what they do in the binary itself, right? So this is the same idea as if we go here, exports loader. So what we're doing in Python is exactly this. We're just recreating this function right here. That's it. So pop over here. We'll do for i in range plain data. Ode equals char of uh, the data at i. XORed with the key. And remember, the key has a length that we need to take the modulus of. So we'll do i mod len of key. There we go. I'll make a little space here so it's easier to see. Okay. And then print, no, return. Yep. Okay. So uh, that should decrypt our data. So now what we don't want to do is want to parse through these blocks. Um, let's just take the two largest blocks because I think that's the, the two configs that we want, right? So it's the uh, block list and the C2 list, and we will uh, print those out. So let's do uh, actually, we'll create a function for this. Mm, no, let's not. For B, no, I in range len of blocks. So we are going to be iterating through each block. If blocks at i equals uh, blocks sorted, the last element of blocks sorted minus one then we want to uh, decrypt it. Decrypt. The key is the next thing, out plus equals. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, chat. Plus equals. <laughs> Thanks, chat. That would have been funny. Um, yeah. OK. Um, so we want to do. Uh, Decrypt, the key is going to be blocks at i plus one, because of course the key is sequentially the next one after the encrypted data, and the data is the block that we found. Yeah, I saw uh, in the chat, I saw that little plus equals out. Thanks, guys. Um, so that'll be i. And then maybe we'll just, uh, oh. Uh, char isn't defined. Yeah, I know it's not defined. Okay, there we go. And then we can print out. <laughs> right at the end, we start fumbling. There we go. So we found our block list, right? That's the first thing. And let's go back here and we'll find the second largest um, sorted block. Print that out, boom, config. Okay, so now we know how to 
um, extract the config completely blindly, right, with just a little bit of Python. It's fast. We don't have to decompile or disassemble the binary. And because we suspect, uh, highly suspect, that the developer is using some sort of macro pattern or helper function when they uh, encrypt this data, the encrypted data and the key will likely continue to be sequential in the R data section. Um, so we can use this trick to continuously uh, extract configs. What could break this? We always have to think, you know, how robust is this? What could break it? If we have a null byte in the encrypted data blob, this will break, right? So we won't get, uh, that pattern will be broken. So that could happen, definitely could happen. Have to handle that, not on stream, but you know, you have to think about how to do that. Um, obviously the most, uh, the easiest way to do it would be to just check the next key, right? Um, you know, you just check the next null byte. But anyway, you have to deal with that. And uh, what else could break? Well, maybe the developer sees the stream <laughs> and they decide to split the key and the data in the R data section apart. So we can't use this trick. So that could maybe break. Um, but other than that, uh, or they could change the encryption algorithm, right? Maybe it's not going to be XOR. But other than that, as long as um, the developer keeps using this kind of uh, you know setup, then it should be uh, it should work for us. So there you go, uh, a little bit over an hour. To be fair, I started, I think, at like 12.06 or something like that, and it's 1.08, so I'm only like two, two minutes over. Um, but anyway, that's how you write a super fast config, uh, reverse engineer, and do it all in an hour. Um, that's basically, uh, that's all there is to it. So uh, what I'll do is I will push this to our GitHub um, so you guys can go check it out there. Um, obviously, like I said, it needs a little bit more work. You need to handle null bytes in the config data if they occur. And you also probably want to make this a little more robust, add some error checking in. Um, I'm gonna leave it in the Jupyter Notebook. Obviously, if you're writing config, you would pull all this out. You'd write yourself a nice standalone Python file. Um, you'd add some error checking and stuff like that. But I think for learning, this is the best way to do it because you can kind of you know mess around with the stuff um, in the notebook and you have all of your history here. So uh, what I'll do now is I will take a look at the chat. I'll stick around for a few minutes. And uh, if you guys have any questions about this or anything, um, let me know and I will try to answer them on stream here. Uh, and for everyone else who just joined for the config extraction, there you go. <laughs> I, I love these pieces of malware. I, I love these simple malwares. I think they're so, um, they're so, you get so much out of them because you don't have to worry about all these extra layers of deobfuscation and stuff. Um, you, you know, I always think they're such a nice uh, learning experience. Uh, some stuff in the chat. Am I going to do more streams? Yes, I love doing these streams. These are, I think these are the future of our channel. I'm still going to be doing uh, videos, uh, nice edited videos. There's one on HashDB coming up soon, a tutorial. If you guys haven't checked that out as well, um, we have a hash service, hashdb.openanalysis.net, and it's HTTPS. Yeah. Um, so there you go. So basically we just launched this uh, on Friday. And so you can look up hashes, uh, malware hashes. There's an IDA plugin for it. Uh, if we go here, where's the IDA plugin? There you go. Yeah, so there's an IDA plugin for it. Um, if you want help for this or you have any questions, you can join our Discord. Link is in the video description. Um, it's open for you to join Discord. Um, join there, uh, say hi to us. And uh, I'll have a video on HashDB, how it all works and why I think it's cool. Um, it's all open source and free forever. We're never gonna try and monetize this, um, which also leads me to, if you like a sub, I set up some Patreon stuff and there's some merch, buy it, support us so that uh, I'm more incentivized to make these videos instead of doing uh, my job, which makes me money. <laughs> so if you guys like these, uh, support us, let us know. Okay, so more 
comments here. Am I doing the flare on challenge? No, I did year one just to see what it was like. It's kind of cool. I have the little coin the very first year, um, but I haven't done it since. I have a personal aversion to CTFs. I like to do real malware analysis for real samples that work in the wild because A, I think they're more interesting and B, the work is applicable. I like that. I don't like to do work for the sake of doing work, right? I always like to be able to do something that is going to have a real impact. So I don't really do CTFs. It's a great learning experience. I did the first one, it's kind of fun. You know, they're, they're fun, they're good to learn, but I don't do them. Um, would you mind explaining how XOR works? It's not clear, uh, not on the stream I won't, but XOR is a simple um, uh, algorithmic, what would you say? Uh, a logic, sorry, it's a logic expression um, that uh, has a, a set of rules where uh, if two bytes are matching, they're, uh, they're left alone. If they're different, then they flip. Um, that's, a terrible that's a terrible explanation. Go on to uh, Wikipedia and just look up the truth table for XOR. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and if you want, uh, reach out to me on Discord and I might make a quick video just what the heck is XOR. Um, what else do we have here? Do you use G Hydra? No, I don't, but there are two super helpful dudes on our Discord um, who use it all the time. Uh, one of them we did a video with, um, Yesco. Uh, he did the binary refinery one. The other one is Lars, and they do uh, tutorials on G Hydra. You can go check them out. I can't remember their exact, I think it's like mal.re. Is that? No, mal. Let me just see here. Mallory? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so uh, if you want to know stuff about Ghydra, mal.re, uh, go check them out. You know, we can't do it better than they do, so uh, we just let them do their thing. Um, good idea to learn C, C++ to reverse engineer. I don't know how you can reverse engineer if you don't know C, C++. Um, <laughs> you might learn it by reverse engineering first, which is kind of cool, but you're going to have to know it uh, if you want to do anything uh, at scale. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, private class on Patreon. No, what we do for Patreon is you get access to a, a Discord channel that's just us, so you can ask us questions. We can like hop on a live stream and help you if you get stuck, so you have that. And if you pay us a whole bunch of money, you get access to our private Git. Um, so we have a bunch of like tools in there that aren't public. Um, but uh, that's not really what we're trying to do. We're just trying to let you guys, you know, just grab the bottom tier and support us. Uh, that's it. You know, uh, we're not trying to trying to sell anything there really. Uh, those are just extra bonuses for you guys. Um, what else do we have here? What's the difference between your hash and Lumina? Okay, that's the different kind of hash. So the hash DB that we set up is for malware import hashing and string hashing. So this is where the malware author creates a hash of strings to obfuscate them, and we can use it to deobfuscate them. Uh, Lumina or Lumina from Hexrays is actually a, a really awesome idea. It takes a hash of the function, and then you can identify the function in IDA um, based on that hash. Different kind of hash, um, different kind of setup. Uh, that's the difference between them. Uh, Lenny Zeltzer, hell yeah, Lenny Zeltzer, man, OG, yeah, definitely recommend him. His work, his, like, SANS courses are awesome. He's a cool guy, um, really helpful, nice guy, definitely recommend. Uh, what else do we have here in the chat? I'll stick around for a few more minutes if you guys have more questions. If I didn't get something, just post it again in the chat, and I will try to, um, I'll try to get it to it. I'll stick around for another few minutes. Mini rats are C++, yes, lots of stuff is C++, lots of stuff is C, definitely a good idea to know it. Um, yeah, some people say you can be a malware analyst without knowing programming. Yeah, it's true. I've known uh, decent analysts who don't know how to code, um, but they're not this kind of analyst. They're a different kind of analyst. Um, the whole industry has grown and matured to the point where you can have different teams specializing in different things. Um, you can have people who are just doing top level analysis. So they're taking their reverse engineering reports and they're tracking actors and campaigns. Those people don't necessarily have to know anything about programming. Um, you can have like uh, junior SOC analysts who are doing more like 
uh, simple triage type stuff um, and they maybe they know some scripting and stuff like that but they're not super into reverse engineering you know there's lots of roles now that industry is so mature so no you don't have to know it uh, you don't have to know how to program to be an analyst but if you want to be this kind of analyst you want to be a reverse engineer yeah you have to know um, what else do we have here either Hydra. I think I already <laughs> answered that <laughs> Um, what else do we have here? Um, all the cool malware authors use Go. Oh my God, don't spread that around. Go is a friggin' nightmare. <laughs> it is a nightmare to reverse engineer. Um, if you guys are interested in Go, uh, oh, Null and Null, is that his name? My old colleague, Alex. No, what is... Maybe that's his Twitter handle. Here, just bear with me here. I have a tip for you guys. Yes, all right, what is your GitHub, Alex? Show me your GitHub. So um, Alex, one of the smartest guys I know, super awesome reverse engineer. He doesn't use F5, he just likes to look at the dis disassembler. Um, he has recently taken on Go and he's been putting out some really nice, helpful stuff on his GitHub. I wish we could, oh, there we go. Oh, it's his name. <laughs> okay. Well, that's easy enough. Um, so go to, uh, if you're, if you're on GitHub, uh, if you're reversing Go, um, obviously Ida released a new, like Hexray's released a new, um, uh, a new version of Ida that handles some Go stuff. But if you really want to dig into the internals, uh, check out Alex Handel's um, GitHub. He has some nice stuff on it uh, that, that'll help you with that. Um, he's a good, you know, good resource to go to. Also check out his Twitter um, if you guys want to know about Go. I Hopefully I'll have him on at some point to talk about this. He also wrote the Ida Python book. Um, just a really a wealth of reverse en engineering knowledge. Uh... Uh, advice on transitioning, uh, lots of software dev and some reversing. Uh, yeah, that's going to make it easy for you. Uh, so basically the best way to do it, also maybe the hardest way to do it, but you'll, you'll get good fast is to pick pieces of malware and go through the whole analysis. Um, that's my advice. You want to get into this business. You want to become a reverse engineer quick malware reverse engineer pick malware samples, just go to malwaretrafficanalysis.net, grab those zip files, right? Uh, let's copy this here. So this is how you go, how you transition into this if you have a reverse engineering and programming background. If you don't, that's gonna be a little bit hard, but if you do, go here, pick these, you know, download these files and analyze them. Uh, Google, ask on our Discord, ask on Twitter for help if you get stuck. Um, and the best way I think uh, to go from zero to hero is to look at other people's blogs on the malware and see if you can replicate it yourself and literally write out the analysis that you're doing. Um, that's, I think, the best way to do it. Again, it's, it's not the easiest, it's hard, but it's the best way to, to get through is to pick a piece of malware, analyze the whole thing, write a report on it, pick another one, write a report on it. Uh, I've seen a lot of people come into this industry um, a lot of people I've talked to, you know, friends with now, uh, and I saw them do that exact process. And now, you know, they're people that you probably see, you know, writing reports on Twitter and stuff like that. Um, is there an Ida plugin? Yes, for Go. Yes, there is. Definitely use it. Um, I don't understand what you XOR there and how you figured it. I'll look at it later. Yeah, um, the uh, the Jupyter Notebook will be up there so you can play around with it yourself um, and also you know, you can watch this video and just do the same thing in Ida and you can kind of figure it out. You can also use a debugger for this. Uh, it's not too hard. I like to do things statically, but if you want to use a debugger, you can watch it actually XOR, excuse me, each byte piece by piece might be uh, helpful. Um, any groups for noobs starting out professionally? The struggle is getting certified. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, again, this is the same question in a different format. And uh, basically my, my advice is if you want, again, if you wanna be an analyst, it's a little different, but if you wanna do what I do, I can help you. I can at least give you one path there. So if you wanna be a malware reverse engineer, the best way to do it is to pick binaries, pick, you know, grab Doppel or grab, 
you know, this thing, squirrel waffle or something, reverse engineer the whole thing in Ida, document every single function, what it does, write a little report on it and publish it on Medium. You know, just do that and then pick another sample and do it and get some feedback. Join our Discord, join, there's a reverse engineering Discord, um, join those and ask questions. Share your report, ask people what they think of it. You'll get feedback, people are pretty helpful in this community and you'll get good fast. That's the that's the best advice I can give for this kind of stuff if you wanna do that. Um, yeah, report writing takes a long time. Yes, but it's one of the most important things. If you can't explain what you found, the findings aren't that valid. You know, they're not useful. Not that they're not valid. They're not useful. You need to be able to explain what you found. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's kind of uh, what I would recommend. Uh, getting certs helps you getting getting jobs. You know, you know, if you want to pay for certifications, it might help get you a job. But at the end of the day. If you produce a bunch of medium articles proving that you can reverse engineer stuff, it's going to be, you know, it's going to go a long way to getting you hired, getting you a job. Um, okay, so I think that's it. I'll give you guys uh, one more minute. Any, uh, any last questions? And then we're going to kill stream. Uh, is picking sample is a random thing? I mean, pick, pick you know, pick popular samples if you want to if you want to start um if you want to start reverse engineering stuff pick stuff that's popular because then other people will have analyzed it and written about it um so that's probably the the advice i'd have again i would say pick some of those ransomwares pick like dark matter or pick revil you know those are those are awesome binaries they're not too hard they're not heavily obfuscated um there's obfuscation but uh but, you know, they'll, there's lots of feedback. There's lots of public discourse about it. So you'll get feedback on your work quickly. Um, what else do we have here? Medium blog or website. Oh, I just say medium because it's easy. I mean, do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. I just mean publish it. Publish it publicly. That's that's all that matters. Um, so that you can get feedback. Because, you, you know, if you're just talking to yourself, you're not going to improve. You don't, you can't do that. You need feedback. Um... Oh, thanks guys. Yeah, um, I like doing these streams. Um, so yeah, thanks for the feedback. Uh, we'll do more. And hopefully I'll give you guys a bit more warning next time. Uh, <laughs> check out our GitHub. We have lots of nice tools on there. Lots of stuff that I've used here today, uh, we have on there. Go check it out. Um, check out our Patreon. Um, I don't know what it is. Patreon.com <laughs> slash Labs. Is that right? I think so. Uh, uh, oh, I did it wrong. Look at me fumbling around here. Uh, did that work? Yeah, there you go. Look at that. Go support us. Look at those Ida stickers. <laughs> and remember, if you support us, we'll give you a nice role in our Discord. You can ask us questions and stuff like that. Um. And also, if you are like a diehard YouTuber, you can also like join our channel. It's the exact same membership privileges as Patreon. Uh, it's almost indistinguishable, except that you're on YouTube. Um, okay, all right. I think that is about it. Yes, we will do more. All right, so with that, I'm gonna throw us into the outro. Uh, I made this uh i actually updated it last night with new music so we don't get copy strikes so hopefully <laughs> hopefully it works <laughs>